So back in the early 2000s, I was working at this biotech company, right? And I noticed some of the developers using this strange, almost archaic, futuristic looking operating system and terminals. And I asked them uh, why they weren't using Windows. And one of them laughed and said, uh, well, it's Linux. And because we actually need to get work done. And as funny as that sound, that really blew my mind. And I really wanted to try Linux. Uh, even though at the time I would have had a better chance of operating a proton accelerator than using a Linux terminal. And so that leads right into the question of today's video and one that a lot of people eventually ask, can I switch from Windows to Linux without giving my computer a lobotomy, burning down my house, or otherwise losing my will to live? And the answer is a resounding probably, maybe, no, I'm kidding. Definitely yes. And that's the reason I wanted to make this video. So switching to the Linux doesn't feel as intimidating and helps you prepare without feeling like you're being shoved into the deep end of the pool without a life jacket. So having said that, this video is really aimed more at beginners, especially Windows users who are kind of curious about Linux, maybe tried it a few times or have heard that it's better, but aren't exactly sure why. Uh, at the same time, I wanted to make sure that I give clarity for intermediate users who've dabbled with Linux a few times, maybe tried a few distros, tried Fedora or Pop! OS, or run Linux on their home labs. And if you're a Apollo user, someone running Arch, maintaining servers, or compiling kernels before breakfast, uh, welcome. You'll probably breeze through most of this, but you still might pick up a few insights or enjoy seeing things from a different angle. Also, I will leave links to my free Patreon with some cheat sheet notes for everyone uh, that you can access there. So let's walk through what, in my opinion, are five considerations to make before switching to Linux. And that starts with number one, which is arguably the most important, and that is why do you want to switch? Are you still on Windows 10 or have older hardware and you don't want to upgrade to Windows 11? Are you looking for a system with better security or something less resource intensive? Uh, maybe you want to experiment or maybe you want to move into something that's open source. Or maybe you're just sick of Windows and tired of all Microsoft altogether. And your motivation is important because unlike Windows, which tries and frankly fails to be a one-size-fits-all, Linux really isn't built that way. Uh, there's not one Linux. There's dozens of versions called distributions or distros, uh, each created with different goals, use cases, and for different types of users. And while it's nice there's so many choices, it can also feel a little bit intimidating at first, especially when you're staring at a huge list of options you've never heard of. And that brings us to our second consideration, or number two, which is your hardware. And Linux today is way better with hardware and drivers than it used to be, but different distros are still aimed at different types of machines. If you have an older laptop or desktop, you'll probably have a better experience with something lightweight like uh, an XFCE-based distros. These use fewer system resources, update less frequently, and will still run fine on computers that are 5 to 10 years old. Uh, but if your computer is fairly new, you know, recent CPU, modern graphics, newer Wi-Fi chips, then you might lean towards something like Ubuntu, Fedora, or even OpenSUS Tumbleweed. Uh, these distros get updates much more often and include newer drivers out of the box. Fedora, as an example, is what people tend to call bleeding edge, meaning it supports the latest hardware super fast, but because updates come out so frequently, there's a slight chance you might hit a bug here and there. Ubuntu takes a slower, more methodical, conservative approach, so it tends to feel a little bit more stable for beginners. For consideration three, let's talk about Windows apps and software installation. And I think aside from the learning curve, the biggest source of apprehension for newer users is wondering which of my Windows apps will actually work on Linux. And the good news is that even if you rely on a few Windows-only programs, Linux still has a lot of options for you. If you take Microsoft Office, whose current version doesn't run natively on Linux, you can still use alternatives like OnlyOffice or LibreOffice, both of which are compatible with Microsoft formats, although LibreOffice may have the occasional formatting or font hiccup. And of course, there's always the free online version of Microsoft Office called M365, which works perfectly in all modern desktop browsers and Linux. 
Another option is using tools like Wine and Bottles, which work together to let many Windows programs run surprisingly well on Linux. Wine acts as the compatibility layer that makes Windows applications run in the first place. But configuring it can be kind of a pain, uh, but that's where Bottles comes in. Bottles builds on top of Wine and gives you a ready-made isolated bottles with the right Wine version, dependencies, and settings already tuned for specific apps or games. Even better, Bottles includes a library of one-click installers that handles everything for you smoothly and takes most of the guesswork out of your Windows apps and whether they'll run on Linux. And if you're a gamer like I certainly am, Linux has gotten way better thanks to Proton, which helps thousands of Windows games run with little or no extra work. It's certainly not perfect. It has a long way to go, but it is certainly a lot better than it used to be. Uh, if you want to check if your favorite Windows app or game will work, you can look up on WineHQ, Bottles, or ProtonDB, and I'll leave all the links in the description. If something on there is rated gold or platinum, it usually runs great on Linux. Now, when it comes to installing software on Linux, this is another area that kind of freaks people out. But Linux works a bit differently from Windows. Instead of downloading random .exe files from websites, most apps come from the distro's built-in software repositories. You can install and update everything through the Distro Software Center or Package Manager, and your whole system updates cleanly with one button. And this is where Flatpak is worth mentioning because it's one of the easiest ways to install modern Linux apps. Some distros like Fedora, Linux Mint, and Pop! OS already include Flatpak support out of the box. Others like Ubuntu just require a quick one-time setup, and once it's enabled, it seamlessly integrates into the software center where you search for your app, clip, install, and you're done. That brings us to number four, choosing a distro and desktop environment. And before we get into specific recommendations, I want to clear up two things that make people nervous early on, and that's the Linux file system and the terminal. Uh, yes, Linux is structured differently than Windows under the hood, but that will have almost no impact on your day-to-day -day usage or experience. Uh, just like Windows has its documents, downloads, and pictures folders, Linux works in a similar way and puts all of your stuff into your home folder. And that's where you'll probably spend most of your time. The deeper file system exists, but you probably will never encounter it too much unless you do some poking around. The same goes for the Linux terminal. Uh, people hear the word and imagine they'll need to type in commands for everything, but that's just not how it works in modern Linux. Most tasks like browsing, installing apps, managing files, gaming can all be done through the graphical user interface. If you do use the terminal, it's usually a quick copy and paste command and you'll pick up the basics naturally over time. It's not worth your time to try to memorize a bunch of commands. With those worries out of the way, choosing a distro and desktop environment become a lot simpler. The main difference you'll notice is how the interface looks and feels. Some desktops are immediately familiar, like Linux Mint with Cinnamon, Zorin OS, or KDE Plasma, all giving you that classic taskbar and menu layout. Others, like GNOME, offer a cleaner, more modern workflow that some people end up preferring once they get used to it. And if you're wondering what a distro or desktop environment actually means or how they're different, uh, a distro is just a package version of Linux with its own set of tools, update style, and philosophy, but they all have the same core system underneath. A desktop environment is the part that you interact with. It's the part you see, your panels, your menus, your file manager, the overall layout. Think of the distro as the engine and the desktop environment as the interior of the car. You can pick the combination that feels right without committing to a whole new vehicle each time. And I actually did a video on Linux desktop environments that I will link at the end of this video if you want to check that out for more information. Your experience with Linux can also help guide your decision. Beginners might be more comfortable with distros that offer more stability and ease of use, like Linux Mint or Ubuntu or Zorin OS, because they come with a lot of sensible defaults and large communities that make troubleshooting a little easier. More savvy users might enjoy something more customizable or cutting edge, such as Fedora or OpenSS Tumbleweed or Pop! OS, which ship with newer drivers and features, but also expect the user to be a little more hands-on. Uh, but at the end of the day, the best way to choose is to actually try them out. And booting a few distros from a USB is the Linux equivalent of taking cars out for a spin, seeing which one you like the most, and going from there. 
Booting a Linux distro from a USB often called live mode is basically like taking the operating system for a test drive. It lets you see how everything is going to work on your actual hardware without installing anything or risking your Windows setup. I would actually recommend you write down your daily workflow, the apps you use, the tasks you rely on, and anything that must absolutely work. Uh, and then when you're actually doing the live mode test, uh, walk through your list, open up your documents in LibreOffice, try your preferred browser, launch a couple of games, log in the Zoom, uh, test your microphone and your webcam. Basically, make sure everything you depend on behaves as you need it to. Just remember that you are using a USB drive, so the speed is not going to be as great as if you were running off of the hard drive. If you have a NAS or self-hosted storage or even a big name cloud service, the good news is that almost all of them work perfectly on Linux. Uh, these tools don't rely on anything Windows specific. Uh, most NAS systems like Synology or QNAP, uh, Ugreen and TrueNAS, uh, and personal cloud platforms like Nextcloud are managed entirely through your web browser. So you'll use them exactly the same way you did when you were on Windows. For day-to-day -day file access, Linux has built-in support for network shares, so you can open your NAS folders right from the file manager, just like shared folders in Windows. And if your NAS or cloud service has a sync client, many offer native Linux versions. And if not, the browser interface usually works just fine. And while you're testing, keep in mind you're never locked into a Linux desktop. Uh, switching desktop environments on Linux is incredibly easy. You can install multiple desktops side by side, try them out, and pick the one that fits your workflow without reinstalling your entire system. So to test out a Linux distro in live mode, you can use something like Belenet Etcher, which flashes a single ISO to your USB drive. Or if you're feeling a little more adventurous, you can use what's called Ventoy. A Ventoy lets you put multiple ISOs on one USB, even organized in folders, and it will still detect them at boot. Most Linux ISOs range from two to five gigabytes. So an eight gigabyte USB is the bare minimum, but a 32 gigabyte stick is ideal if you want to test out different distros. Once you've explored your options and found a distro that fits your workflow, you'll be ready to move on to the next step, which is actually installing Linux and making the big switch. And number five is preparing to switch. And I would start by making a simple checklist so that transition is smooth, starting with making sure that any of your backup drives are formatted correctly to NTFS or XFAT so Linux can read them. Uh, then go ahead and back up your photos, your documents, your browser bookmarks, your game saves, and any critical information that you need, making sure that any external drives are not encrypted. Once everything is saved, decide whether you want to dual boot and keep Windows and Linux side by side while you get comfortable, or go for a full migration once you're confident you don't need Windows anymore. I will post a video at the end of this where I did do a dual boot video that might help you make the decision. After installing Linux, restoring files is actually pretty straightforward. You just plug in your backup drive, sign into your cloud account, or connect to your NAS and copy everything into your Linux home folder. Everything should work just like it did in Windows. So those are my top five for switching to Linux, but there's a few honorable mentions worth keeping in mind that I wanted to bring up. First is the distro's open source philosophy, and some distros like Red Hat and Ubuntu are backed by corporations, while others like Mint and Debian are entirely community driven. So it really comes down to whether you prefer a distro with corporate resources and backing or one that's shaped entirely uh, by the community and those who actually use Linux. Regardless, the Linux ecosystem is built on transparency and shared ownership, which means you're never locked into one distro, one company's decision, or any restrictive licensing. That flexibility is a huge reason why so many people stick with Linux once they actually try it. The second is Linux's built-in security across all of its distros. And Linux is more secure than Windows out of the box thanks to its permission model and the way the software is installed. Most apps come from trusted repositories instead of random downloads, uh, which cuts out a huge source of malware. Some distros leave even more security focus, like Fedora and Ubuntu, which ship with strong defaults, while others like Linux Mint prioritize ease of use but are still far safer than a typical Windows setup. Now, Linux obviously isn't invincible, but for most people it delivers a safe, low-maintenance experience without any extra effort for security. 
Anyway, that's going to wrap up on our video tech fans. Uh, this list obviously doesn't cover everything, but I hope I've given you enough of a roadmap so you feel more confident if you're thinking about making the switch to Linux. And of course, let me know in the comments what I might have missed or if you've got any tips you'd like to share that helped you when you first moved to Linux. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please give me a like or drop me your thoughts in the comments. Also, make sure you click on that subscribe button and notification button so you don't miss any more episodes that are coming up. A special shout out to all of my loyal Patreon members for your support. Thank you all for watching and we'll be talking to you again very soon.